ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Rizzotto. What's going on, everybody? And welcome. My name is Stephen Rizzotto. I cover the San Francisco Giants for SFA and the host of RizzoCast, the podcast that features current and former big league players, coaches, fans, media, and others who are regarded as some of the brightest minds around the game of baseball. Today's guest is Alana Rizzo, a longtime baseball reporter and on-air personality. Alana previously covered the Rockies as a TV reporter before joining MLB Network in 2012. In 2013, she joined the Dodgers broadcast as an on-field reporter, a role that she served until 2020, and she has since rejoined MLB Network as a regular contributor to High Heat with Chris Mad Dog Russo. We discussed Shohei Otani. By the way, this was recorded during the winter meeting, so Shohei had not signed with the Dodgers yet. We talk Otani, Todd Heldon's Hall of Fame chances, her career in broadcasting, being an on-field reporter, being bilingual in journalism, objective on air thoughts on podcasters and bloggers remember those comments in the postseason women in baseball uh, her wonderful dog foundation working with chris mad dog russo so much more this is episode number 159 and let's get started all righty and we are back and ready to roll with rizzo cast and alana rizzo is here she is nice enough to hop on the podcast and join the show alana how's it going happy holidays and uh, and welcome well, thank you. It's going well. It's uh, nice to be on the Rizzo cast with my last name is Rizzo. You got to get Mike and Anthony on here at some point too. I know those were the two that, that uh, one of these days it's going to happen. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. We're going to get maybe like a panel discussion of all three of you guys. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that would be the dream scenario with all of you, but uh, yeah, welcome to Rizzo cast. It, uh, it is named after you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I uh, hope everybody out there can understand that. Uh, but before we get into anything, Alana, I do want to mention we have to discuss the most important thing out of anything, and it is the holiday season. It's upon us, right? Uh, I've been asking people this that come on. Um, there's friends, there's family, there's food, there's gifts. Are you somebody that is a late Christmas shopper? Do you get things done early? Like what's the timetable for you trying to basically be Santa as we all try to do? Like what, what's your timetable? Do you, do you have your gifts done, your gift shopping done already? Or is that still in progress? Let's hear it. I think I'm about 50, 50. I'm a planner. My personality by nature is one, two plan. So I have probably 50% of the gifts done and wrapped and under the tree. I will say this though. I am much more of a Thanksgiving fan than I am a Christmas fan. I really love Thanksgiving. I love what Thanksgiving represents. Um, you know, obviously C Christmas is a lot more commercialized. Um, I, I do not like Christmas music at all. But I do like Christmas um, and the decor and the movies and all that stuff. I enjoy. Um, I'm about 50 50. The tree and the decorations go up the day after Thanksgiving, but nothing Christmas related prior to that. So um, I still have I still have about. I'd say half half of the gifts to go. I think you'd be pleased to know that I just came in the podcast studio here attached to the newsroom at SF State and I, I, I escaped the Mariah Carey. So oh, you'd, you'd be proud you. of me. Yeah. I am proud of you. That, that's hard to do at this time of year to escape Mariah Carey. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and speaking of the Christmas presents, there's going to be a big market team blessed with a little bit of Shoei Otani in their stocking this winter. And we are recording this on, on the Monday of the winter meetings. And by the time this comes out, maybe he already have signed, maybe he's some surprising some people. Uh, but as someone who kind of follows this saga every day, uh, how unique is Shohei Otani's free agency compared to some of the other ones that you've seen? Because well, you've never seen a two-way player yeah, like this before. I mean, he's so he's so unbelievably unique as a person yeah. and a player. So his uh, you know his free agency status is that much more unique. Uh, you know, you think about Shohei Otani. The the caveat though is that he's not going to be able to pitch in 2024. So it's like, okay, are you signing him thinking like? All right, long term, he's going to be able to be on both sides of the ball for us. Or are you trying to sign him for a one year deal with an opt out, you know, to get him just as the DH? Um, 
you know, Shohei Otani, I truly believe, and I don't know him personally, I've never spoken to him. So I just want to be very transparent with that is I think he wants, I, I know for a fact he wants to win. So I think whatever team he chooses to go to um, is going to be a team where he can be a contender. And uh, obviously he has tremendous amount of talent. Um, you know, Mike Trout has a tremendous amount of talent, but I just don't know that the Angels are ever going to be able to get to the level that Shohei wants to be. Um, you know, I had a conversation today on December 4th with Dave Roberts uh, for our show on High Heat. And uh, I asked them, you know, where are you guys at the Shohei sweepstakes? And of course, you can't talk about free agents in depth and they're not going to, you know, they keep that stuff pretty close to the vest. But I will say this, um, Dave did tell me that Mookie Betts will be their starting second baseman next year, which opens up a right field spot. So obviously they re-signed Jason Hayward, but Jason Hayward's more of a, a role player bench guy, um, you know, more than an everyday right fielder. So uh, whoever gets them is going to be a team, obviously, that wants to spend money. Um, it's going to be a team that needs to make a splash. I don't believe the Dodgers need to make a splash. I think the Giants, where you are, need to make a splash, especially since they lost out on Aaron Judge. I'm, I think they made the right move with Correa in that whole situation. Um, but, you know, I can see... I could see the Blue Jays. I could see the Dodgers. I could see the Giants. Of course, you can see the Yankees. I mean, the Yankees are always in on everybody, right? Um, just as the Dodgers are. I could still see the Cubs. So uh, there's a few teams that are, you know, everyone's kicking the tires, those that are allowed to um, or able to. But, you know, all, only the huge market teams that actually have an opportunity to win now are going to get them. That's one of the best terms of the year, kicking tires and and checking in and where you hear all the the insider talk and it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you know, Otani certainly a big story, but another big story that's coming up, and I know the network likes to touch on this and, and your show, especially with High Heat, which we'll get into in just a bit. But the Hall of Fame is happening and, and uh, the Hall of Fame announcement coming up in January and the ballots out. And um, there's so much time spent comparing and contrasting and this time of year, I'm going to throw a name out you that's that's on the ballot because I know you're familiar with this person uh, in the club that he played for, Todd Helton. So I'm sure you, you've had a lot of time to kind of think about Todd Helton's candidacy. Um, what do you think his case is for Cooperstown? And and because he's close, he's close, and a lot of people think he's going to get in this year. Yeah, I think he I think he will get in this year. And I, I again, just being fully transparent, I covered the Colorado Rockies for five seasons. So I know Todd Helton very well. And I know that the knock on him is that he played 81 games at Coors Field every single year. Well, you know what? He also played 81 games on the road. And, uh, you know, his his home road splits are not that drastic um, to where you'd be like, there's no way that this guy is not a Hall of Famer. And here's one thing a lot of people don't think about or consider when it comes to Coors Field the amount of wear and tear on an athlete's body trying to recover when their home field is course field is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a lot more of a physical toll to pitch and to play at altitude than it does in other places in the country. So that being said, the way that Todd Helton was able to keep his body ready um, and perform at a high level every single game, not just at home, but on the road, um, to me is a testament of, of his talent level. And I think Todd Helton is a hall of famer on any team that he would have played for, not to mention his defense never took a day off. Um, obviously he was a very good defensive first baseman. Um, Todd Helton to me is a hall of famer and he almost got in last season. So for me to think that he's not going to get in this year, um, I, I would be lying if I said he's not going to. I mean, this is the one thing about the Hall of Fame vote is that you can't compare eras. I hate that we compare Shohei Otani to Babe Ruth. I hate that we compare this player in today's game to a player that played 30 years ago. I don't think that's fair to do so. But I'm also a small room person versus a big room person. And that's why I like the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame versus like Canton. I feel like everybody get in, gets into the NFL Football Hall of Fame. Um, whereas I think baseball, there's a lot more of a strict criteria. Again, though, I think as time goes on, people's memories fade and people are, I think we live in a very forgiving society. So those perhaps with asterisks next to their name, for whatever reason of off the field shenanigans, perhaps get in based on merit later on. Um, but to me, to answer your question, Todd Helton is a hall of famer. And the, we can't act like there's choir boys in there. So for anybody oh, listening, look at, look at Ty Cobb, look at, yeah. I mean, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not the morality hall of fame. It's the baseball hall of fame. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And, and good point about Coors Field too, because when, when Dan O'Dowd came on here, he said, not only does he have to play elsewhere, he has to play in West coast ballparks that are usually at sea level or maybe sometimes below. 
so it's not just the, you know, you're used to a certain spin on a baseball, but then just how you feel physically playing away from there um, just, just seems like uh, probably the same effect as someone coming into there, but it's the opposite when you play there for 81 games a year. Um, I want to get into your career just a little bit. Um, grew up in Colorado. Your, your roots are certainly in that area. And take me through kind of the origin story of how you became a baseball fan or even a sports fan for that matter. Cause I don't know how big baseball was or has been in Colorado. The the Rockies came in 93. Tell me a little bit about the origin of, of Alana Rizzo, the sports fan. Yeah, I was definitely more of a football fan growing up. No question. We didn't, as you mentioned, we didn't get the Rockies until 93. I'm dating myself, but we were, I was already a senior in high school by the time that the Rockies got there. So we had pro ball, but we didn't have major league baseball. So I remember the first day that the Rockies ever played, it was still at the old mile high stadium because course field wasn't built yet. I was in my accounting class and Mark Baronic, who was the head men's basketball coach at Sierra High School, but was also my accounting teacher, kind of like rolled the TV into the room and allowed us to watch the first game ever in Colorado Rockies history. And I remember that being a very poignant moment, you know, and but I was already on my way to, you know, to college after that. And I wasn't a big baseball fan. I just never really followed it. I was a I was and still am a big Denver Broncos fan. University of Colorado football, basketball, that's where I went to school, I went to CU. Um, so baseball wasn't my passion, but sports have always been a huge part of my family. Um, I have a huge, huge, you know, family that we're all, even though we're spread all over the country and are, are very different in terms of personalities and all of that, we are all Broncos fans. So that's one thing that can kind of bring us all together, tie us in together. So, you know, I left, um, journalism is actually my second career. When I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Colorado at Boulder and I got a degree in um, international business with a marketing emphasis. So that was my bachelor's degree. And I worked in sales and marketing in the hospitality industry and in the beverage industry. So I worked for Pepsi-Cola and then I worked in, in hotels and I was just really unbelievably bored. I did that for five seasons and was very, or five seasons, five years and was very unfulfilled. Um, and then I just kind of took a chance and took a risk and, and bet on myself and went back to school. So I didn't go back to school until I was 28 um, and I got a master's in journalism. And then to make a very long story short, I just started from the bottom and worked my way up. There's 200 television markets, and I started in market 142, which is Wichita Falls, Texas. And, you know, I covered it. I was a, you, I think you guys call them MMJs now, like multi marketing, multimedia journalists. We call them one band bands, you know, one woman band. Like you do everything, you're doing the job of 10 people. So, I uh, wrote all my own stuff, shot all my own stuff, edited all my own stuff, the whole deal. And I was in Wichita Falls, Texas for nine months. And then I went to Madison, Wisconsin, which was market 80 something, 85 or something like that. And, you know, I covered the Badgers, the Packers, the Bucks, the Brewers, um, you know, Badger hockey, uh, both the men and women's team won the, the uh, you know, the Frozen Four in the same year. And um, it, that was just a blast. Madison's a great college town. Um, and I was there for three years and then I had an opportunity to go home and I wanted to go back to Denver. So I went back to Denver. I was a freelancer, started working for, at the time it was Fox Sports, Rocky now Mountain, and then it became like Liberty Media. Then it was DirecTV. Then it was AT&T Sports and it was Root Sports. And now I don't, I think MLB Network's taking it over. So um, despite all the different changes in the network name, I was uh, covering the Rockies for five seasons. And that's really how I got into baseball is because it was the opportunity. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to get a baseball job. It was just kind of like what was available to get me back to Colorado. And uh, at the time, Aaron Cook was their ace. And, you know, if you know anything about Aaron Cook, he's a sinker ball guy. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I really had to, it was quite the education for me because baseball wasn't my thing. I mean, I knew the basics, of course, but I certainly didn't know the intricacies of everything baseball. And now I can't imagine my life without baseball. So it was the one thing that got me to get home, but it was another thing entirely of, of what it became. So I was with the Rockies for five seasons and then MLB Network called um, and, you know, the opportunity to go national versus being at a regional network is incredibly appealing. I think to anybody, anybody wants to go national. So I left Colorado. I went to MLB Network in New Jersey slash New York, and I was there for two years. I was there 12 and 13 and, you know, did all the different shows there. I used to host Quick Pitch and all that stuff. And then, um, you know, and then the Dodgers started their new network in 2014, and I had really missed being at the ballpark every day because I had done that for five years, and it just became ingrained in my DNA. And um, they, you know, they approached me, and and um, you know, it was, it was intriguing to be with the network from the bottom, like from the ground up, at, at, from the inception of the network, and. 
you know, and then I went, I went to LA and it was the greatest, um, time ever. I mean, I was there for seven seasons. I covered, you know, every single year uh, I was there, they were NL West champions. Um, obviously they won the world series in 2020. Uh, they should have won it in 17, but that's for another podcast. You have a ring. Oh yeah. I have, I have the two NL, um, championship rings when we went in 17 and 18. And then I have the world series ring when uh, they won it in 20. So I now, how often yeah. do you like flaunt that around? How often Never. does it come out Never. of wherever? No, okay. they, uh, no, they're in a safe, they're gigantic. I mean, they're, they're man's rings. They're, they're, they're huge rings. Um, you know, and they're super gaudy. Uh, so it's not something that I would wear, but I didn't want like the women's pendant. Like I wanted a ring. So, and they were gracious enough, you know, I was a Dodger employee and they were gracious enough still to this day, they treat me like family. And that's why, you know, when people ask me what my, who my team is, I was born and raised in Colorado, but I'm a Dodger fan because of the way that they treated me and they treated me as, as a member of the family. Um, and they treated me with nothing but class and respect. And I will always be indebted to them for that. So, um, you know, and I was there for seven seasons, they won the world series in 2020, um, which was a weird year. They won it in a bubble. I lived in Texas for, you know, three, four weeks that we were playing at Globe Life Field. And um, then at the, then we had, you know, I had to make a decision personally. Uh, my fiance, now husband, um, lives, you know, lives on the East Coast. I was on the West Coast and it was just, you know, his job changed. So it was like, so I just, you know, I had to make a decision like work-life balance. And then thankfully MLB Network uh, had an opportunity and they were gracious enough to, to want me to come back. So that's a, it's a very long, you know, very short story of a very long journey, but I've been doing this now about 20 years. Yeah. And I definitely think a lot of people might know you from MLB Network, but I think a lot of people love you from your work with the Dodgers. I mean, it just significant impact and, and, you know, being a sideline reporter there, um, and for those that are intrigued in broadcasting and, and many people listening have, you know, always say, get broadcasters on, get broadcasters on, because it's it's a very interesting uh, profession. And I think for those listening, especially women uh, who, who want to serve in the role, because I think it's, it's a very big uh, impact role of being a sideline reporter. Um, what would be your schedule from for a game day at Dodger Stam? Take us through kind of like when you would get there, when you would kind of start doing things to the time you would leave. Yeah, it's uh, it's not, you're not showing up at 6.59 for a seven o'clock game. I can tell you that much. I mean, we're there four and a half hours before the game starts. So, you know, four and a half hours before to get basically on camera ready, if you're fortunate enough to, to have a team that does that for you. Um, and then three and a half hours before the game starts, before first pitch, the clubhouse opens. And, you know, I was the pre and post game host. So I would go into the clubhouse every single day, gather my interviews for whatever topic we were discussing that day, whether it was like, I don't know, um, outfield assists or whatever. Uh, and then I'd go talk to the outfielders or whatever. It was like, you know, a, a good infield defense, or they had issues the day before with their infield defense. And I would talk to the shortstop and the second baseman, blah, blah, blah. So whatever the topic was, those were the interviews I would go and, and gather. And then I would of course always do the Dave Roberts. Baseball is the only sport where the manager coach, whatever you want, the manager has to talk to the media twice a day, every day. So, and there's 162 games. It's a lot of time with these people, um, especially like day game after night game, like nothing changes and you're still trying to come up with creative and interesting things to talk about. So gather all the interviews, you know, prepare for the game, prepare for the storylines. And then we would host an hour pregame show every single day during the game. I would do three or four or five uh, sideline hits, um, just based on what the game allowed, what the game warranted. If, if there was something I could add to it, I never just wanted to be on TV to be on TV. That, that to me is, you know, it was pointless. If I couldn't add something to the broadcast to me, there was no, no need to be on. So, you know, just, to, you know, the game dictates what you do. And then of course, after the game, uh, post game, if we won, which with the Dodgers was a lot, I'd be on the field doing an, you know, either a walk-off interview if we were home, um, or, you know, a winning interview or whatever, if we're on the road, um, and then go listen to the Dave Roberts presser for post game, and then go back into the clubhouse and get however many interviews for, you know, whoever was involved in the outcome of the game. And that's every single day. And I did about 200 games a year because you figure Arizona six weeks in spring training and you, I lived in Arizona for six weeks, wherever the team was, I was. So if, if pitchers and catchers reported on February 12th, so did I. Uh, you know, full squad reports on the 19th, I'm already there. Um, so 
30 odd games in spring training. I did about 155 of the 162 regular season because you figure five to seven of those are going to be on national TV. Um, and then I would do all of postseason. And with the Dodgers, thankfully, you're perennially in the postseason. So it was, you know, it's a lot of games. Like during when I was with the Dodgers, all you had to look at was the Dodgers schedule and you knew where I was. Um, so, you know, it's 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 a it's a interesting gig because it's um incredibly time consuming, but it's also a neat experience to be able to be with the team from beginning all the way to the end. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that they're high on here, like journalism school, wherever journalism school you go to is, is being a bilingual reporter. And it's, it's, I imagine it's incredibly, and look, I, one of my regrets is not paying attention to two years of high school Spanish and only walking away with hola, mi amo, Steven, E too. Like that, that's, that's, that's horrible on my part, but I feel like the ability to position yourself with an entire like additional sector um, of, of a big league clubhouse that maybe a lot of the beat reporters can't even reach is super important. So discuss kind of that value in like speaking Spanish fluently and, and being able to communicate that and, and kind of how that's impacted your career. Cause it's also, you know, you've carried it over to your, your work on high heat. Like Chris Russo is not speaking Spanish and we'll get to, <laughs> we'll get to that guy in a sec. He's not speaking yeah, Spanish. Chris so. Russo doesn't he have to speak Spanish. He speaks his own language that nobody understands, but um, no, it is definitely an asset. I mean, my mom was born in Havana, Cuba. So I've been speaking Spanish since I was you know little. And I, you know, I certainly don't claim to be able to speak it as well as she does or as well as native Spanish speakers, but I definitely speak it fluently enough to be able to speak to players. And I think it's so important to be able to give the players a platform where they can speak in their native tongue, because I would far more rather that the player is comfortable than I'm comfortable. Doing English to Spanish and translating back is one of the most anxiety ridden things that I do. It makes me very nervous. It is not an easy task to be able to ask a question in English, then ask it in Spanish, listen to what the player is saying, translate it back to make sure you're representing what he says in the appropriate way you know, and then continue to go back and forth, not to mention not everything in English translates word for word in Spanish with the baseball vocabulary and colloquium and all that stuff. So it's very, it is very nerve wracking. I don't enjoy it, but I'm thankful I can do it because again, I've been able to get a lot of interviews that perhaps other people can't, or at least at the very least, it gives players an avenue to be able to really just talk instead of sticking to just the cliche phrases that they know or that they're comfortable with because they don't want to sound, um, you know, they don't want to offend anybody or sound um, like they don't know how to speak English and stuff. So I always appreciate the players that really try to speak English and learn English um, because it's difficult. I mean, I can't imagine having to do an, an interview on television in a language I don't speak. I mean, that's, that's frightening. So it's definitely been an asset and we've gotten some, you know, cause there's a lot of amazing Latin and Spanish speaking players that are stars in this game. And we're missing an opportunity if we don't talk to these guys, you know, we're, I mean, think about Ronald Acuna Jr. He was the MVP in the national league. You know, if you, if you don't talk to Ronald Acuna Jr., I mean, what are you doing? That's a missed opportunity. And I know that he knows he does know some English, of course, but to be able to allow him to express himself without him having to worry or think, I think is a huge benefit to him and to the listening audience and obviously to the Atlanta fan base. Yeah, no, 100 percent. It just opens so much more doors. And uh, going to kind of like a more journalism broad question, I, I know you're really big on objectivity and, you know, keeping it real and. I think that's awesome. And, and, you know, I'm watching the journalism field kind of lean a different way at times, kind of away from that. And I'm very much content with learning on how to, how to do things based on, you know, fact-driven information. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, people, people welcome you into your homes when you're a sideline reporter or you're on MOB network um, six months a year. Well, now at the network, you know, 12 months a year. Uh, is there an added responsibility that you feel as someone that fans like really have been able to trust throughout the years. Is there like an added responsibility to kind of be real with them despite being employed by MLB network, but you know, despite being employed by the Dodgers, is there still kind of that responsibility that you need to, you know, deliver the fact-based information that maybe the media world is going away from? I think the biggest thing is to know that it is not my job to be first. It's my job to be right. 
And I think what happens now in today's world, especially with social media, is that everyone is trying to be the one that broke the story or everyone wants to provide the, the scoop of the story. And that's really dangerous. I think there's a, there's definitely a place for social media and I think it can be a huge asset, but there's also a huge danger to social media too. And um, you know, I think it's important, especially as a, as a reporter for a team, that people see us as the conduit to the team. We are the connection between the fan and the player or the fan and the organization. So there is a responsibility there to make sure that we're providing accurate and truthful information. It's not our responsibility to sugarcoat stuff. We still have to be objective or else our credibility is thrown out of the window, you know? But it is not our job to bury the team. I mean, you can be objective and you can be critical, but you can still be professional about how you go about it. And what frustrates me is that again, it's it's you know, as time has gone on, the storytelling and the writing and the fact gathering and the fact checking has gone by the wayside to bring in people that are providing just clicks or clickbait or you know, let's just um, you know get this out there quickly and we'll we'll apologize later. You know, we'll ask for we'll beg for forgiveness versus asking for permission. And I think that's a really dangerous way to go about things. And I think it's important because it, once you ruin a, a relationship with a player because of you burn that player or he or she trusted you and you don't take that responsibility seriously, good luck ever getting that player or any other player. Uh, again, so there is a responsibility to do your job, be professional, understand that they have a job to do as well, but your reputation will precede you. I mean, you know, before I got to LA, people already knew who I was because of the work I had done. And, you know, baseball is a very small world, very small world. Um, so your, your reputation precedes you. So it, it, I'll use a Jim, an old Jim Tracy line when I, when he was the manager of the Dodgers, it would, or the, uh, well, he was the manager of the Dodgers, but also manager of the Rockies too. It would behoove you um, to to make sure you're doing your your homework and that you um, and if you're if you're if you're not willing to say something in front of a player's face, you better not say it on social media or write about it in a blog or put it in an article or say it on TV because you're gonna have to walk right back in there the next day and face that player. Uh, no, one hundred percent, and. and- just to shout out the columnists in the the San Francisco Bay area, like we don't see them a lot. And when they write something like it, 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 it's a few weeks until we see them again. And it's kind of like, you know, you should be able to write something and then show your face the next day. And, you know, yeah, I mean, and there's people in your market that do a tremendous job. Susan Slusser does Absolutely. a tremendous job, yeah. you know, um, there, you know, there's so many people in your market that do um, really, really great work. And, um, again, it, it takes a long time to build a good reputation. It takes seconds for it to go away. So, you know, keep, keep that in mind too. And, and Twitter can be your Twitter, social media, Instagram, TikTok, whatever the heck you guys are on now. Um, you know, it, again, it can be an asset, but it can also, it can also hurt you quickly. Yeah, no, that's some good advice for, for myself and anybody listening out there with the Twitter account or any social media that, that want to have a career in this. And, uh, I briefly want to touch on, I mean, there are some comments made during the postseason about the podcasters, and I don't want to stay on that too long. I, I want to go into a kind of a broader discussion about that because there was the apology that happened. But to a broader discussion about how the media landscape has has changed, what have you kind of noticed about the shift in the content that is produced? Do you, and and, and like, do, do you kind of like stick by those like original statements about the podcasters and the uh, the bloggers? Uh, Because it is, it is a, it could be an issue in the sport, but there's a lot more content that's being produced. So what have you noticed about that kind of evolution? I think my biggest frustration is that I do feel that there are people, I'm not saying that this was this person, but there are people in our space that are there to create drama. They're there to get the clickbait or, you know, they're, they're, they're more of the, writers of the headline versus what the story is actually about. And, you know, as a, and I, it it was coming from, I was incorrect in my statement and I, that's why I apologized to him personally. And then I went on air and I apologized because I owed him that. Um, But I think what I was frustrated about is that as a, as a reporter for a team, you're there every single day, you know, the ins and outs of this team, you know, if, 
you know, I would know, I knew when guys, what time they did their crossword puzzles. I knew what time they worked out. I knew what time they didn't want to be bothered. I knew exactly what they ate. And when they did, I could, I swear to you on my, on my dog's life, I could be on the top of the dugout stairs outside onto the field. And I could see guys coming from the clubhouse. And just by this much of their shin and their shoe, I knew who it was walking up. And that's just how, like, how ridiculous it is, how much time you spend with these people. So my frustration as a beat reporter, um, or as a team reporter, I should say, because I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, you know, a written journalist, um, is that you don't, in my opinion, you don't have that right to just go into the clubhouse every once in a while during, you know, opening day, all-star break, postseason, wear meetings and just take little bits and pieces and, 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 you know, try to try to start something. Now he is a, he was, is a credentialed reporter um, who, who does good work, you know, apparently, I mean, I, you know, I don't know him well. So again, I, I spoke out of turn and I apologize for it, but that was my frustration is that you, it, it, it is so difficult to get in this business. It's even harder to stay. It's like, you know, trying to make it, trying to come get called up from the minor leagues and have a decent major league career. It's the same for journalists that are trying to make a name for themselves and get to where they want to be. And to give anybody, um, again, not saying, I'm just saying like in a broad approach, I will, I just want people to take it seriously and understand the repercussions of, of what you're doing. Like, what is your angle? You know, again, would you say that, would you do that in front of the player? Did you ask the player yourself what exactly was said and in what context he meant it? Or did you just do it to, to get a click? So, you know, it's changed, but again, I'm a lot older than a lot of these people now. And, you know, maybe I'm the, you know, old lady yelling at clouds or get off my lawn. Or I mean, maybe, maybe that's, maybe I've become a Karen. I don't know, but I just know that I would rather be respected for my work ethic, my professionalism, and knowing that I have a mutual respect for the interviewee that I would hope they have for me. And I think it's incredibly, relate. if you don't have relationships, professional relationships and trust in this business, you don't have anything. And that's that was my frustration with that. The way I handled it was inappropriate, for sure. Um, but it is it is frustrating that you know it's like I, I remember every every postseason it's like where the heck have all of you been where were you in you know in June in Cincinnati uh, when it's hotter than sin you know where where were you then um, so that that you know that I mean but that happens with every with everything so it's it was just a uh, it's just the tides have changed in journalism and it's it's just very different now than than when I got into it but again that's two, it's been two decades and you know that's the if that's the way things are evolving that's the way things are evolving it's just not my style yeah well if it doesn't if it if it means anything I don't think you're a Karen <laughs> I don't <laughs> think you're a Karen Alana and uh uh and I I understood what you're saying and and you know some people could agree and disagree plain and simple but some people just don't like put it away. You know what I'm saying? Like there's the apology and then it continues. And, you know, I was on Twitter. But that's social media. That's social yeah. media. And yeah. that's, that's where, again, where the danger can come in. Um, but again, I, a good friend and it had nothing to do with this particular situation, yeah. but a good friend of mine, who's also a journalist and, and very, uh, she's very well read. She's very good. Um, she said, you know, yesterday's news wraps today's fish. There's always something else coming up in the news cycle. You know, there's always like, okay, next. And that's just the world that we live in. And I was, I was very embarrassed by my actions. And, you know, I, I never wanted to, like, it, it came off so wrong. So it was not hard for me to apologize. Um, but I do stand by, like, I, I do think it is important, you know, to do a good job and to present yourself in a professional manner and to, you know, really think about what it is that you're putting out in the world, because you are, you know, fans or people that are reading you expect it to be correct you know so um there is a responsibility that comes along with that yeah and and do you do you feel like you do well because i mean it does happen from time to time where you know you'll you'll log on to twitter and you, you'll see some some messages about your gender you'll see some messages about your personal life you'll see some messages about the way you do your job and your looks and i mean when that stuff happens is it kind of like the i'm not going to look at it or do you find yourself looking at it and getting angry by it? Or is it just come with the territory, like you mentioned? I think it's just as you get older, like you just don't care anymore. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, like I'm very, I'm probably, I'm 
could be your mother. I mean, honestly, like I could be your mom. Um, so yeah, don't I've, say that. Don't do that to yourself. I, no, I'm serious. It's like I'm, I'm not embarrassed, but I don't care. Like the okay. point is, I've been in this industry for 20 years. I, I didn't even get into it until I was 28. So, I mean, how old are you? You're 21. in college, right? Okay, 21. exactly. So I'm 27 years older than you. The point is, like you, you realize what's important in your life and what matters in your life, and you realize that. I know my integrity. I know my character. I know who I am. It's very easy to be a keyboard warrior and sit behind a keyboard and say whatever the heck you want to a person or about a person without ever having to show your face, own up to what you said. You know, it's, this is, again, this is the world of social media that we're in that people think they can say whatever the heck they want to say. And um, I know that I do good work. And I know that the players and my colleagues, more importantly, uh, respect me and respect the work that I do. Have I made mistakes? Of course, of course. In a 20 year career um, on live television, you're bound to say some stupid stuff. Um, but I think by and large, the overall body of work and the overall resume supersedes some of the dumb stuff that I've done. And I've done some dumb stuff. I mean, we all have, right? Um, I just caution you guys, like, you know, folks your age, kids your age, students your age of just be careful what you say, be careful what you do, because sports directors, news directors, people in hiring positions. Remember, the people that you want jobs from, the people that are hiring are my age. They're not your friends. They're not your pals. You can't communicate with them in emojis. You can't communicate with them um with bad punctuation, with bad grammar, with bad sentence structure, with bad, you know, I, that's just, that's the people that are in positions that you want to be in are your parents' age. Remember that, you know, you're not communicating with a pal, like you're communicating with a professional colleague that grew up at a very different time than you did. So keep that in mind. Always be professional over everything. Very important and advice there. For all of us. You know, for me too, yeah. you know, absolutely. And, and just kind of going on, you know, I mean, you're one of the biggest advocates uh, for women in sports media. And and we've, we've mentioned some, some of the ups in, in your career. And there, there's certainly plenty of downs too, as you mentioned, and there's some stuff that you've had to go through just because you are a woman in the industry. And I've always been impressed with the sisterhood that is in baseball media. And you mentioned that it's like a small world uh, with, with, you know, the, the baseball media industry. And it's almost like it, it's a big wall uh, and you guys are all kind of locked together and, and you guys go through things together. From my point of view, it's like Lauren Shahadi knows Melanie Newman and Melanie Newman knows Sarah Langs and Sarah Langs knows you. And it just keeps going on and on. And Amy G knows Susan Slusser and you know, Susan's it just, it's one big wall and, and the list goes on. And it, it seems like a very inclusive group that almost knows they they kind of really have to stick together yeah i i could not be more grateful for the group of women in my world that uh i'll do what i do in fact uh amy g is one of my closest friends and we are we are on a text thread uh with seven there's seven of us uh sideline reporters it's amy g of course with the giants myself formerly with the dodgers now with i guess with everybody um Julia Morales, who covers the Astros, Jenny Kavnar, who does a great job with the Rockies, Sophia Minert of the Brewers, um, Jody Jackson of the Diamondbacks. Am I missing anybody or is that is that all of us? Jenny, Sophia, Amy, Alana. Yeah, that's all of us on, the, on that particular thread. And we bounce ideas off of each other all of the time. You know, like, hey, this, this situation came up today. How would you handle this? Or sometimes we just send like the idiot things that you know, fans will send us that are so ludicrous or some of the requests that we get that we're like, really? Um, but it's an opportunity to be able to, A, keep your sanity and know that somebody else that has the exact same position that you do is going through the exact same thing. And I respect the heck out of these women. There's so many women that are so, Melanie Newman is phenomenal at what she does. I love Lauren. I mean, I've known Lauren, Lauren and I started on the exact same, a week apart at MLB Network in 2012. So I've known Lauren for 13 years. You know, I, I threw Lauren her baby shower for her first kid. Um, you know, Sam Ryan used to be at MLB Network. I have a tremendous amount of respect. There's a lot of women in the industry that I absolutely adore. And I think do such a great job. Like Brittany Giroli, who, you know, writes for The Athletic. Um, there's just a lot of really quality, talented women 
Uh, I mean, the knowledge that Sarah Langs has just goes beyond even explanation. She's an unbe she's unbelievably talented. Um, so yeah, I have a I have a great deal of respect for women that have come before me uh, and women that are in it in the trenches now and women that will come after me. And I think there's room for all of us. There's room to re to you know lift all of us up. I will say this though, and I'm very very um, deliberate on how I go about helping people, because if you're in it for the right reasons and you want to work really hard and you want to, you want to, you're willing to make sacrifices and you're willing to move and you're willing to make no money and you're willing to pay your dues. I'm there for you because we've all done it. We all want the same end goal, but we all have very different paths. But if you're in it just to get on television or just to be famous or just to meet a player or just that, that to me is that sets us back. So, you know, I, I'm willing to help anybody, but I will also say this, there have been a tremendous amount of women that have helped me in this industry, but there's also been a tremendous amount of men too. So I think that's very important to acknowledge our male counterparts who also recognize the need and the value for women in the same space that they're in. So, you know, every big boss I've had has been a man, you know, say you can read that however you want, but I've been given opportunities as well by men. And I'm grateful for that too. I'm grateful for what they were able to see in me too, but I will, you know, Jenny Dell with, um, you know, she used to be with the Red Sox. Now, of course she's on CBS sports. I saw her the other day doing Alabama, Georgia, and I'm, you know, I'm thrilled for her. Like she's worked her butt off. She earned it. Like none of us have gotten these jobs just because we're women. You know, we, we, our resumes speak for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That's re really important. And a few more here before we, we take off and I've kept you for too long, but one of the really cool things that you started while in Los Angeles was, the Guidry's Guardian Foundation, and it's a nonprofit organization for those that don't know, and it's focused on basically saving dogs from the streets and a lot of times shelters as well. And I know this is something very near and dear to your heart, and there's a definite need for something like this everywhere, especially when you constantly look in, in the dogs at the dogs in need of homes. And uh, I'm sure there's a cool backstory to starting this about, you know, beginning the beginning processes of it. So tell me about that and a little bit about the organization, Guidry's Guardian. Uh, Guardian yeah, I, uh, I appreciate you letting me talk about it. It's very important to me. Um, Guidry's Guardian Foundation was officially launched in 2019, and it's named after my dog, Guidry, obviously, who passed away uh, in 2019, right after I launched the foundation. But I adopted Guidry in 2009 from the Humane Society of Boulder Valley. And um, as I mentioned, I didn't have major league baseball in Colorado until 1993, but my dad is Italian or, you know, born in New York. Um, my mom is Cuban born in Havana. Um, so growing up, I guess if I was going to be a baseball fan, I was a Yankee fan and, um, certainly not anymore, <laughs> but I got, I, I adopted Guidry and, um, then I just really, I didn't grow up with dogs. So I didn't have a dog until again, 2009, really. And I, it just really opened my eyes and my heart to the, the absolute travesty that is our shelter system across the United States. I mean, hundreds of thousands of animals are euthanized every single year, simply because of overcrowded shelters and the amount of abuse and neglect that these animals have faced, um, whether it's owner surrender or, you name it. Um, it's just atrocious behavior and we have failed our animals miserably. So I launched Guidry's Guardian Foundation um, July 4th of 2019. And again, the mission is to save as many dogs as we can, whether it's out of high kill shelters or off of the streets. And the main mission is to raise money to fundraise, to pay for their medical needs, their transportation costs, adoption fees, foster supplies. I don't have a physical building, whereas we, you know, I don't, I don't pull dogs out of shelters and, and house them. I try, I'm basically a rescue for rescues. So uh, we've saved hundreds of animals all in, in Guidry's name. And, uh, you know, I continue to do so. We're, we're very small. It's just me. And I have, you know, one, my vice president is my best friend and she does all the boots on the ground stuff. And um, we've saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dogs in Southern California because that's where I lived when we launched it. But we've also done, in fact, here's a story for you, San Francisco related. One of the first dogs we ever helped, I wasn't even an official foundation yet. I was doing a Dodger game. We were probably in the fifth inning. One of my colleagues, a producer, called me panicking, like hysterical. He was hysterical. 
And he saw what he thought was a trash bag on the side of the road by USC and ended up being a German shepherd that had been hit by a car and just left for dead on the 110 by the University of Southern California. So I said, and again, I'm doing a game, right? I said, just, just get the dog to an emergency vet. We'll figure it out later. Like, I, I don't know, just get the dog to a vet. Like, we'll figure out the money later. Long, long, long story short, this jaw, this dog had a broken jaw, a collapsed lung, like was in bad shape. Anyway, we got all the medical somehow, somehow I raised like $25,000. I, I don't even know how, cause it wasn't even an official foundation yet. Um, and we got the dog, the medical care. I named him Spencer. And then um, I fostered him for a hot second. And then the, one of my good friends who lives in Napa Valley, her family owns Kiever Vineyards in Napa said, hey, I'd really like to meet Spencer. So I drove with my my friend, the friend that I was talking about um, that said, um, you know, yesterday's uh, newspaper wraps, today's fish or whatever. She went with me, she drove up and we took Spencer to this family. They adopted him and they renamed him Jagger. So that dog went from being left for dead on the side of the 110 to living on a vineyard in Napa. Wow. And he's the he's the Napa like dog. And then he goes home with them at night. So it's those are the types of things that we do. It's 100 percent donation based. So we don't have a corporate sponsor or anything like that. So every cent that we raise goes to helping dogs. I don't take a salary from it. It's not you know, it's 100 percent nonprofit. Like I don't get paid. Nobody, you know, um, but it's all in Gedry's name because it's so important to adopt and rescue and foster because these innocent animals are getting literally murdered just because of no space. So it's, it's very important to me. That's really incredible. That's some good stuff. And I think uh, you're, you're making a lot of families, you know, happy and, and you're saving a lot of dogs lives. So that's really awesome. And what's next for the nonprofit? Is there anything, any events coming up? The biggest thing, yeah, we actually have um, in California, I'm, I'm flying back to Los Angeles. Uh, we have a scorekeeping 101 event. Um, it's on January 6th at Dodger Stadium. So I'm sure Giants fans are super thrilled about that, but you are welcome Giants fans. Um, to come and learn how to keep score. I did it in 2020, unfortunately, the day that Kobe died. Um, and it was at the time, it was just for women, because I think sometimes women get intimidated, you know, they want to learn and they want to be active. And, you know, they get a little bit of intimidated um, by their male colleagues or counterparts. But now this one's open to anybody, all ages, to learn how to score a baseball game. And every single cent goes to the foundation um, so you can still, there's plenty of time to register. You get free lunch and meet and greet photo opportunities. Um, you know, it's just a fun day and, you know, I'm hoping to raise $5,000 for the foundation and, uh, you know, and go from there. So that's on January 6th. You can check it out on my Instagram page, which is at Alana Rizzo and also at Gidry's guardian. Very awesome. Good stuff. And final thing real quick. I want to ask about Alana Rizzo, the current era of Alana Rizzo in baseball and uh, you, you moved east. You're now a contributor on MLB Network's High Heat. And I think it was a very interesting surprise for everybody to see you paired with uh, Christopher <laughs> Mad Dog Russo. Uh, and, and I have a theory about this. My theory, and I don't know if you could confirm or deny, but my theory is that he started running out of people and organizations that he hadn't pissed off yet. Okay? <laughs> and you, you, do not, you do not have to confirm or deny this maybe when we stop recording. Uh, and they needed a good cop in in the room here. All seriousness, though, legendary figure. He could be some people's cup of tea. He could not be other people's cup of tea. Uh, but what was your expectations going into this, working with Chris? And, and how did you even get on that show? Because it's oh kind my of God. That's, that's, thing. That's, that's such a funny assessment. Number one, Chris is Chris knows more about baseball in one finger than I will ever know in my entire life. The man's memory and knowledge of the game is insane. He's like, he's a savant. He really is. A, it's, it's, it's crazy how knowledgeable he is in his memory. Um, yeah. Chris is a different breed. Um, he, but he is. No pun intended. Mad dog's a different breed. <laughs> very, good, very, good, very good. I didn't even think about that, but he is as every bit of what you see, that's who he is. That's not an act. Like we went to dinner in Denver a couple of years ago when the all-star game was in, is in Denver. And that's exactly, I mean, that's how he orders food. Like that's who he is. He's like, Hello, he's, yeah, he's that animated. He's just, he's loud. He's, but he's, he's a, he has been nothing but welcoming to me and gracious to me. Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't have to agree to have me. It's his show. Let's be clear. 
Um, he didn't have to agree to have me on that show. And he did. They were going in a different direction. They wanted somebody that was more TV savvy um, as far as, you know, kind of directing traffic and being able to get us in and out of break. And honestly, yes, I do know the current player. I do have relationships with the current player. I mean, Chris, like sometimes he's still stuck with the 77 Yankees, you know, so he he brings a very historic perspective and I bring more of a you know, an active perspective. And I do, you know, I have relationships with these guys because I've seen them in the field. So it's like, they, they can relate to me. They, they, you know, and yes, yeah, Chris is, he's brutally honest and he'll, you know, so yeah, there's, there's an element of that where they're like, well, we know Alana can get guys on. Um, so I think we provide a, a good balance for one another. Um, having a, a debate with him is pointless because he can, he can see both sides of it and he knows everything about everything. So I just try to bring a, a softer, more current approach, more of a humanizing approach that these guys are players, but they're people first. And, um, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a good balance. I mean, it's, he, yeah, I mean, we may not be everyone's cup of tea. He may not be, a lot of people don't like, you know, that I'm on the show. They want Bruce Shine back and I get that. Um, but it's been three years of us together and, and who knows, you know, if, if it moves forward, I've loved every second of it. It's, it was, yeah. I mean, when they approached me, I was like, huh? You know, I was thinking more like maybe intentional talk or something, because, you know, I just kind of flow with Kevin more. Um, but, you know, it's been it's been an interesting dynamic, but I'm super grateful to Chris. I'm super grateful to the network. And uh, yeah, that's it's funny that you say that. But I, I do. Um, a, I can speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can barely speak English. Um, I can get the uh, players names right. And um, I've been listening to him saying Yamamoto and I'm just like, it's it, Yoshinobu. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, funny. that and uh, like he keeps calling Carlos Rodon Rendon. But, we, yes. you know, we have to, we, I give him I give him like tests and stuff. So, no, he's a great guy. I love him. Um, I like he how is, he goes, uh, the he, outfielder from Seattle. <laughs> it's yeah. like, he's uh, he's not in the Radio Hall of Fame for nothing. I mean, the man is a legend. He's an icon. He's been doing, you know, he was he was the radio talking head way before everybody else was. Yeah. So um, he has a long, long, long resume and he's one of a kind and he's earned every bit of the success that he has. And did you pay Joey Votto under the table to yell at him? Joey, Joey came to me for that. Joey uh, reached out to me probably two or three weeks before that happened. He was like, I want to make sure... Because normally one of us will just do the interview. It's very rare that we tag team because of the delay. I'm in Massachusetts. Chris is in Connecticut. You know, Joey was in Cincinnati. Uh, so Joey was like, hey, I want to make sure you're doing the interview because when you ask me questions, I'm going to just, I'm going to be polite. I'm going to ask the question, blah, blah, blah. And then um, when Chris does this, I'm going to rip him a new one. But, but Joey Votto loves Chris, loves him. So I knew about that weeks going into it. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. Joey Votto is one of my favorite humans. He's, I always say he's a two nation treasure. I love the guy. Um, so yeah, I knew about that, but that was, that was a trip. I was like, oh boy, here we go. I didn't know what Joey was going to say, but I knew he was going to act crazy. And did you really expect Chris to retire? Did you really expect, did you expect to go and like, oh, I'm the new host of high heat. Let's do this. No, I oh. knew, I knew, I knew that Chris was not raised. And then he tried to claim he was just saying it for radio, not TV. But I tell you what, we weren't originally going to go to the World Series. But because of all the stuff that he said about Arizona, that he would quit on the spot, retire on the spot, blah, blah, blah. If they, you know, if they uh, won, blah, blah, blah. That's why we got to go to the World Series. Because he, net, the network wanted um, him to have to face the Diamondbacks. And the Diamondbacks could not have been more gracious. They were such good sports. They played along. Like, they were awesome so to Derek Hall and Tori Lovello and the whole Diamondbacks organization they did an amazing job like handling it and and playing along and having fun and it was it was cool yeah definitely really cool well Alana I kept you for way too long and and I but I really appreciate the time this was awesome uh and and it was cool listening to uh, your journey and I think I'm going to take a lot of out of it I think other people are going to take a lot out of it and um it was it was definitely a pleasure to have you on Rizzo cast. So thanks, <laughs> yes. for, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Keep me posted and best of luck in your broadcasting endeavors. Thank you. Right. Oh, God, I almost had the Christopher Russo uh <laughs> I mix it up my words here. Thank you, Alana. Appreciate it. And everybody could go ahead and, and follow um Alana on social media. Do you want to plug yourself and where you're at? Yeah, no, it's just, it's pretty easy. It's at Alana Rizzo, A-L-A-N-N-A-R-I-Z-Z-O. So one uh, one L, two N's, three A's. 
R-I-Z-Z-O. And then the foundation, of course, which was far more important than anything I've done is um, at Gidry's Guardian. So G-U-I-D-R-Y-S Guardian. Now I'm going to have to look back at my emails to see if I put two N's. So I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, probably I, wouldn't, have I wouldn't have responded if you didn't. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Don't miss those two N's. They're capitalized on the Twitter <laughs> profile. So don't miss them. Uh, and everybody can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast and more stuff to come. A lot more broadcasting stuff to come. Uh, the previous episodes were with uh, the Richmond Flying Squirrels play-by-play guy and also the Sacramento Rivercats play-by-play guy. So a lot of broadcasting stuff. Everybody kind of asked for it. They're like, get more broadcasters on. So that's where we're doing it. And uh, yeah, we will see you next time with more stuff. And Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays if I don't see you until then.